everybody, welcome back to Pagan's Witchy Corner. My name is Pagan, and I am joined by a very, very special guest, Ryan Smith, who wrote the book The Way of Fire and Ice, The Living Tradition of Norse Paganism. I have been a huge fan of yours for quite some time, actually, since this book came out. It was uh, the first, one of the first books I actually got when I got my Audible account which the author or the uh, narrator did such a beautiful job with the book. And then I got a pretty hard copy from Llewellyn, which made me even happier. Now you're on my show, so yay! <laughs> but welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you. It's great being on. And thank you so much. It's yay. I'm, I'm still getting used to the whole like meeting people who love the book and being like, wow, thank you. Um <laughs> It's actually one of, if we wanted to equate it to a holy book, it is almost a holy book in our household now, uh, because it has so much power and truth written within the words themselves. You did such an epic job with the book. We have a nice little like Norse paganism bookshelf in our home, and it sits firmly above it. So it, it is one of our favorites, and we absolutely love it and are actually using it to teach our kids Norse paganism. So you did a really great job, and I'm so thankful that you actually wrote this book. It was needed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's go ahead and talk about it. Why did you choose to write the book? You know, obviously, there's lots of other books out there, but some are questionable, some are better than others. Uh, what was your inspiration for writing this book? Honestly, it was something that like happened at uh, Many Gods West, which is a conference that happened in Olympia, Washington, a couple times a few years back, um, where after I'd finished doing a workshop on I think it was like something about anti-fascism. Um, <laughs> uh, like one of uh, the people who participated, who's active in the ADF, um, came up and said, hey, so I do like prison ministry. Is there any book you can recommend to me that's really like solidly inclusive and nothing questionable or anything in it? And I kind of stood there for a minute being like, um, uh, uh, I'm going to need a second for that. <laughs> Um, then he said, well, maybe you should write it. <laughs> I, I don't know how many times over the years, my husband and I both being Norse pagans, that people have asked, you know, what's a really good Norse pagan book? And I'm like, um, Neil Gaiman's book, even though it's half fiction, it's like it's not even in the prose edit. Like the, there's no real good Norse paganism books, or there weren't at the time, most of them had some sort of question ide questionable ideology with them, until your book came out. And my other favorite Norse pagan book, which just came out also recently, was the book of Loki and Sigyn by Leah Svedensen. Also another really great book and really great human being. So uh, both of those are really fantastic books. And I'm I'm really thankful you wrote it because it really was necessary to help people learn that Norse paganism is not ingrained with fascism or fascism. Sorry, my words are difficult today. Everyone in the, who's listening to this, you all know that sometimes the words are hard for me with the MS. So I apologize if I stumble today. They've been hard this week. Uh, but yes, it, it was. I'm really thankful that you wrote it. Now, when you were writing it, um, you did take some kind of controversial approaches with really talking about the differences in all the branches of Norse paganism. And what was your, did you really kind of think that it was going to be such a light in the darkness when you wrote it? Uh, honestly, I, a part of what my thinking was, even with that part was just giving a sense of this is where this book is in relation to all these others and not trying to claim to represent all of like heathen practice and Norse pagan practice because you know there's a lot out there a large chunk of it is really questionable um when it's not you know outright fascist or something mm -hmm. so I, I felt it was kind of necessary to be like look this book is not trying to say that it speaks for everything ever it's just speaking for this one particular interpretation and approach um and i i mean i know i've heard like a few different like you know objections to how i sorted things in there um 
but well you know yeah like sorry oh I, I go ahead please continue but like it was again like it's my interpretation and my opinion and part of why some of that's in there is just to say look we're doing something that's different here and the biggest thing that I was going for was let's just try to start over go from you know first principles mm -hmm. like what's actually in the source material what do we really know about these peoples like part of where like the whole idea of living tradition came from was because the Nordic peoples were like an oral culture like it was an oral tradition there wasn't anything like the poetic edda or the prose edda for them it would have been something that was like stories they heard from their parents as they were growing up or like sung in the halls during like feasts and like ceremonies and stuff like that and referenced in conversation like kind of almost like the same way as like the marvel movies are right now in popular mm -hmm. culture but if marvel was the culture for you know hundreds of years um <laughs> I mean, I, I like Marvel's Thor and I like Marvel's Loki and all that. And I think that the Marvel stories are great. Uh, it would be great if they followed like the true storyline correctly. And then we would have modern interpretations of these. But, you know, it's still very nice to kind of see some fun variations of the gods and their ways. So yeah. it's always a fun way to look at it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and And I use that like, metaphor because in some ways like a good way of even looking at what we know in the eddas and in the folklore and everything that survives is it's kind of is sort of like the continuity within the marvel comics of mm -hmm. you have these characters and these figures who are broadly consistent throughout most depictions but the details vary quite a bit and sometimes you get really controversial takes, like when Captain America suddenly was Hydra or something like that. Um, <laughs> like, I don't even read the comics and I heard about that. I was yeah. like, that doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I but, don't read the comics. I barely keep up with the movies. Uh, they're just pure fun for me. But, the, you know, I do keep up with the Thor ones because I do like the Thor ones. I, I'm a very big Tom Hiddleston fan. I, I'm also low key in, which makes me even happier because I'm like, oh, you got so close to getting it right. Just wrong hair color. But everything else is almost on par. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, if we think of the lore that way, then we have to go, well, wait, this is something that lived and breathed and changed mm -hmm. there wasn't anyone who was going this is who thor is and these are the official symbols and colors and blah blah blah. like there was nothing like that there's no evidence that anything like that existed um like there probably were strong traditions in certain mm -hmm. places like in iceland for example thor because the weather as i'm told in iceland like the climate just doesn't really work well with making thunderstorms except during volcanic eruptions so thor there's like evidence that Matthias Nordvig has talked about of Thor being invoked by Icelanders for protection against volcanic eruptions. So, you know, we know there was variation and development. So it makes sense to say, all right, let's start with what we've got, go from there and then make something that can live and grow on its own. I think that that's a really fun way to look at it as well. So uh, I, I didn't even know that about Iceland, so that's really interesting um, to kind of think about how uh, Thor would be applied to different cultures in different parts of the world where some of the lore doesn't match up perfectly with that area. So that's really awesome. Not only that, we talk about Odin being the wanderer and he went to so many other places and touched so many different cultures. And there's he's in aspects of those cultures. So it's very interesting to kind of see how all of that works throughout the world and a lot of times you know especially here in north america we often forget how big the world is because we're so used to the united states being so big that it's hard to imagine it's like oh hey well you know britain's a postage stamp compared to you know like texas and everything else and then you think about that and you're like oh but the culture spread everywhere else so it wasn't just that which also really kind of brings about another great topic that you touched on that is really important when we talk about norse paganism and the fact that we should be pulling people and telling people that folkish beliefs are not what we should be following absolutely and that's a thing that is 
like the more you dig into folkish beliefs and practices, the more it feels like somebody just reskinned uh, Christian fundamentalism mm-hmm. with a Viking paint job. Um, like this isn't to say, therefore, they're not real heathens, um, but more that there are such substantial differences between folkish practice and pretty much every other form of like Nordic and heathen practice that it is fair to say, you know what, these guys don't represent the rest of the community. They are not representative of practice broadly, and their particular interpretation is taking way more from, like, Jim Crow America Mm -hmm. and, like, apartheid South Africa than it is from anything in the lore. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that if you're new to Norse paganism and you are somebody who's listening to this episode and you're like, oh, I want to learn about it. uh, Obviously, read Ryan's book. You will find everything that you need to know in there. But the one thing that you should definitely understand, first and foremost, is that Norse paganism is not a closed practice. It's open to everyone of every race, creed, culture, the whole nine yards. It's open to everybody. So that's the difference between Norse paganism and the folkish folkish version of Norse paganism, which is a lot more closed off. Yeah, like they say it's only for the peoples of the north, which in practice almost always means a paint swatch test. (laughs) Yes, Uh, which if you don't understand the reference of that, that typically means it's based on your skin color. Yeah. So and. And there are cases of, like, people who were, like, high up in the AFA, like, um, one guy, Joseph Block, he used to write as John Mm Upsall, super focused, totally followed the party line, and when their kid came out as trans, they were quietly asked to step back from all, like, of the offices they held within the AFA, the Asa True Folk Assembly, which is one of the biggest focus groups out there, and sort of became persona non grata Mm -hmm. because he actually supported his kid in that instance. But, you know, that kind of is like what's going on with these communities here is like with, with folkish groups and folkish practice, they're very much like white nationalism and Christian fundamentalism playing at being pagans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's also first I guess because I am not of that mindset, I am not one of those types of people, I do not believe in anything like that, so it's really hard for me as a Norse pagan who follows the gods, who loves the stories, who understands the lore, to look at the lore and then look at what they're, you know, preaching, essentially, and go, wait a minute, (laughs) we're talking about people who, yes, these are very northern traditions, but they do have other aspects of the cultures where we just talked about the fact that Odin was known as the wanderer and touched many other cultures and uh, places, but also the fact that, you know, what you were just saying about one of the leaders and their son coming out as trans, I which brings a lot of questions about gender fluidity because of Loki. Anybody who's ever read the stories of Loki and knows the no- lore of Loki um, would know that he doesn't really identify as any gender. He kind of identifies as all and sometimes not even human in that regards <laughs> or humanoid. <laughs> uh, so it, it's very hard for me to kind of wrap my brain around how anybody who practices Norse paganism could not understand that it is far more open than what they're trying to. It's like trying to shove everything down into a box that's way too small. It doesn't work. You're just going to tear it apart. So like in focus practice, they'll say that, you know, the gods and giants are like opposing forces like heaven and hell or something like that. But then when you actually read the lore, it talks about things like, oh, wait, Thor's mother is the giant Yord, who is literally the earth or how uh, Njord and Skadi are married after as we're guild for the Aesir killing Skadi's father. And Skadi is also a giant. Uh, Loki is of the giants. Um, even like Thor, like Odin's 
a mother and grandmother are both described in the Voluspa and the Prosetta as being giants. So, you know, this whole notion of things are cleanly into these nice boxes that also happen to coincide with their very racist worldview. It's just like, it's just not there. Like if anything, the opposite's there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something to also touch on that a lot of times when we hear good versus evil and you know it has to fit squarely in this box or it has to fit squarely in that box and this is all branches of paganism not even just within norse paganism a lot of times that is christian influence that has worked its way in through the centuries and has now gotten to the point where we're like oh well we have to have good versus evil we don't it's all gray it's all intermixed it's all there and it's not always so black and white. You can't have everything be completely light and completely ignore the dark. You have to have both because nature is both. So, you know, make sure you guys are understanding that before you're like, oh, well, you know, well, what about the evil stuff? Uh, on my opinion is there's definitely things that are evil, but they also serve a purpose. Just like wasps. I, I feel that way about nature. Wasps, in my opinion, don't serve a purpose in my, but I know that they do in nature because they kill other insects that are terrible for your plants. But still, I don't like them. So to me, they're evil. <laughs> Same concept. <laughs> Different. Well, that's kind of like, you know, no one's going to invite a vulture over to Thanksgiving. Um, They have terrible table manners. But um. <laughs> I would hate to that see what side dish they them. would bring. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I found it on the side of the road. Check it out. Um, <laughs> I know it's half dead and not really cooked and it has some bugs, but trust me, it's still great. You'll love it. No, please don't. <laughs> it, it's been aging. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's and that's like a thing that I also try to get at in the book is like rethinking like how we even think about like religion and spirituality of because like you were just saying like our whole idea of how we think about religion has been shaped by christianity when we're talking you know the united states europe uh, and south america for example um because you know over a thousand years of being able to go yes this is the way you do it religion has to work this way there has to be central texts there have to be specific institutions there have to be things that are always right and things that are always wrong and a whole lot of these other things that are actually when you kind of look at what we know of pre-christian religious practice really is only just a lot of christian idiosyncrasies mm-hmm like it even filters into like how like academics talk about religion because you know the first universities started as cathedral schools and all of the different like academic positions like professor and dean and stuff like that were originally ecclesiastical offices so like this isn't like you know grand conspiracy thing mm-hmm. or anything it's just you know the influence is there like the structure and the ideas of how they even think about knowledge is there too so it's you know some of this is that we have to like unlearn a lot of what we've been told by society about how these things even work. And then things get really interesting when you do that. Yes, they do get very interesting. And I think that we're also kind of starting to go through societally a a change like that ourselves, where we're having to unteach ourselves um, all of the things that we were taught of how society should work, how we should follow this or how we should follow that. And the reason that we're having to do that now is because we're starting to see a rise unfortunately as far as my opinion goes across the globe of a rise again of fascism and it does unfortunately run very rampant in a lot of the norse communities which we should talk about because that's not how it should be yeah it's you're absolutely right. There is a global rise in fascism. We know that these guys all like talk to each other and compare notes. Like the like Stormfront was always like a web forum that had people from all over the place. Anyone can post on a coon. And we know people like Steve Bannon and like Victor Orban in Hungary and like all these different places are talking to each other. Um, so it's not like this is just suddenly people are feeling fascistic. Because, you know, there's the whole narrative of fascism happened because 
demagogues like Mussolini and Hitler whipped up the passions of the moment and were able to overthrow democracy and all that. And that's like absolutely not true. Um, in, in both cases, fascism rose because there were elements of the political establishment in Germany, basically a lot of the more center and right leaning political parties, business leaders, elements of the army in Italy, you know, elements of the aristocracy and the well to do who cut deals with like the fascists in Italy and the Nazis in Germany to say, hey, you know what, we'll bring you in, we'll put you in the driver's seat so you can go like basically murder all the leftists and things that we think are wrong with society. And you're going to let us just keep doing what we do. And that's kind of what happened in both like the most famous rises of fascism. So it should be no surprise that in the world we're living in generally, these guys are all comparing notes and sharing money and resources and trying to find alliances within positions of power and positions of influence. And the same thing was also true on a much smaller scale with like the folkish and fascists within Norse paganism of mm. that these are groups that were like historically part of why they got as far as they did, especially in the United States and Canada, is because they were able to make all these appeals about, well, we're just doing something different and aren't you opposed to censorship and don't you believe in free exercise and all that stuff? And while conveniently leaving out that, you know, within like folkish spaces and stuff, they were openly deriding anyone who was not following folkish practice and saying they're not real heathens or they're not real pagans at all. Um, it's like, it, you know, fascists always saying free speech until mm -hmm. they have the power to do something about it. Um, yeah. It's very true, and we are seeing such massive rises of it to the point that it's actually very alarming. Um, I mean, many of us saw this coming many, many years ago, myself included, and it was, even for a long time, I, I saw it, and I was like, this is not going to, they are not going, yeah, okay, yeah, they are going to do this. This is exactly what they're doing. Crap. Okay, here we are. And it's a really scary kind of concept to think that it's like, I saw this like six years ago, minimum, and I truly believe that they would never take the steps to repeat history. And now even everything that we have seen just in the last three weeks alone, yes, it's only been about three weeks since Roe was overturned, everyone. I still cannot even fathom that it's only been three weeks because it feels like it's been six months. That's how long the last three weeks have been. Um, it, it's just incredibly scary to see how many people are just coming out of the woodwork and just wanting to claim this fascist power. And it's like, how? How did we get here? And I think a big part of it is because we, including myself, said, no, history won't repeat itself. And we tried to turn a blind eye to it for too long. So now... We have to talk about what can we do about it? What can we do oh. to fix that? The first thing is, I mean, we have to have conversations like this. We have to be forcing the uncomfortable topic. We have to be naming this stuff for what it is. And we also have to be getting a broad agreement of, you know what, anyone who has ties to fascist groups or ideology or material uh, or actually is promoting this stuff directly is somebody who can't be welcome in our community spaces because you know at the end of the day fascism is an, as an ideology is a danger to everybody including the fascists sooner or later mm -hmm. um like fascism always eats itself when it runs out of other things to go after but so it's like, this is a question of preserving the safety of community from people whose intention and desire is to do harm to other people for the crime of existing in a way they consider to be wrong. Like, that's, I think, the most baseline thing. Like, mm -hmm. Declaration 127 was a good first step in that direction. And I think that needs to be, a, like, a more consistent thing of saying, you know what, this stuff's not welcome in our spaces. And by doing that, we create, you know, a platform for broader resistance and broader action. And I think right now that's the biggest thing that I think we need to be doing is finding ways to reach out to other people that are 
near to us um, as much as possible, bringing together community either in person or online that is actively inclusive. And, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you go out and do the big publicized thing in the public park or something like that. Like, you know, please be careful about be what safe. it is that you're doing. You know, you know, be safe. But, the like, world is scary. <laughs> yeah. It, use your best judgment. Like there's a pagan market in Polk County, Texas, that's getting like threats and harassment and they don't even go up until like the first weekend of November. So, you know, like use your best judgment, but um, <laughs> within that framework, like building those kind of communities means people are coming together. They're able to help each other we can always do more when we work together and we share information and resources and whatever capabilities we have. And then, you know, those groups have to start reaching out to each other as well. Like it's not, you know, quick or easy, but if there's one thing that's consistent of throughout history, the thing that beats fascism is organized communities that are actively defending themselves against fascist creep and are then able to be platforms for pushing back. Like, Absolutely. Like whenever fascism has been beaten at the grassroots level, like at with the British uh, fascist party under Oswald Mosley, who, you know, things were, were like, you know, he tried to do things like march through the predominantly Jewish and immigrant East end of London and Londoners came out and built barricades and physically fought them to mm -hmm. keep them from doing it. And, the, it's called the Battle of Cable Street. And it, that was one of the things that broke uh, his momentum within the United Kingdom. Uh, you had the Popular Front in France in the 1930s, where a lot of different like left-wing and left-leaning groups uh, it, through like communications to each other, like directly like below party structures and stuff, were like, you know what, we need to like at least agree that the fascists over here have to be kept out of power. Mm -hmm. um, and wherever people are able to build that kind of mobilization, fascism has been able to be thwarted. And as much as, you know, there are like active fascist elements moving in the U.S. government of more a Christian variety, um, mm -hmm. particularly from the Supreme Court, like that's going to take, you know, a lot of stuff on many levels. And I think part of this isn't just that we have to be able to, we be confronting it within our own community. I think we also have to reach out to other groups like other minority religious groups and uh, uh, marginalized communities like um, the LGBT community mm -hmm. and find ways to say, you know what, we have to stand together and we have to protect each other because they're coming after all of us sooner or later. Yes. And it is definitely sooner rather than later. And, you know, I think it's definitely a wise decision. Um, if you have a group out there, whether it be a religious group, whether it just be a community group or whether it just be a group of friends and family, whatever you want to consider yourself as, start working with other communities, start working with other people. Um, you know, uh, the people that I work with uh, at the Revolutionary Network podcast uh, network, we end up we started a group called the pioneers and we teach everything from homesteading to activism to safe activism because activism is something that can also get you into a lot of trouble if you're not being wise about it and you know trying to really do that but we also want to work with other communities so if you have a community out there and you want to start banding together we absolutely should Absolutely. And there are successful examples of community defense that have happened like during Pride Month in including in like Texas and other mm -hmm. places that saw like harassment from groups that openly called themselves Christian fascists that, you know, people within the community came out and supported them and helped like protect like different Pride Month events. So as grim as things are looking, it's not as bad as things look. And I think that the people, because these different like fascist elements, and this was true in um, the heathen community up until like Declaration 127. And I think this is kind of true now. They have a lot, they have positions of influence and they have positions of power, but their actual means to truly project that power is more limited than it appears. Mm -hmm. 
And with Declaration 127, granted, very different circumstances, we're not dealing with the force of multiple state governments here and stuff like that. But um, the up until Declaration 127 happened, it was sort of like an unwritten rule in a lot of a lot of parts of the Nordic Nordic pagan and heathen community that the folkish were something not to be criticized, that we sort of had to just live and let live with these guys that are openly spouting off like white nationalist rhetoric um, and like harassing anyone who looks a little too gay or anything like that um, to where you had a combined community response to Declaration 127. And there were groups that signed on from over 40 different countries. Mm -hmm. Like up until that point, it seemed like the folkish were almost unassailable. And then suddenly you're getting like over, I think it's like over 200 groups have signed on to it now saying, actually, we're done with this Mm -hmm. and we're throwing the AFA out of community. And since then, there's just been more examples of showing you know what, these guys really didn't have as much power as they thought they did. They weren't as entrenched as they thought they were. And when people started really pushing back, that's when they hit a wall and started losing ground. They've also gotten way more radical and are like, you know, uh, facts about Folkish, which is a great Twitter feed to follow for information on this, um, has documented how one of the AFA's organizers is also a member of the Ku Klux Klan. So they're probably digging more into you know, the white nationalist uh, side of things since they're running out of room to recruit on the pagan side of things. But still, it shows that these are things that can be beaten, that people who have these positions of power are not necessarily invincible. Like, you absolutely can stand outside Brett Kavanaugh's house with a bagpipe if you want to. Um, (laughs) Please do it. Please (laughs) drive them crazy. They drive us crazy. Do it. (laughs) Do it safely, though, just for the record. But yes, please do it. Yeah. You know, incite moderately safe but legal chaos. Exactly. Like, they... These guys are on the advance because they hold a lot of power, but that doesn't make them untouchable. And it doesn't mean that they're not in some ways, I think, making huge mistakes. Like as much as this just absolute like rush of, okay, we're going to trash Roe v. Wade. We're going to eliminate the EPA's ability to do its job and do anything about climate change. Um, And a whole bunch of other equally like far right, um, just like wish list items. And all this stuff is incredibly unpopular. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at polling data, something like two thirds of Americans are like, actually, we like Roe v. Wade. Um, <laughs> we think that's good law. Like something like three quarters of Americans think the Supreme Court is like completely off the rails. It's yes. Like yes. those, are, those are good numbers that people are accurately going, no, actually, this is a mess. And just because they have power doesn't mean we should be obeying it. And, you know, like for like a, for a really good example, was, there was the Norwegian resistance to Nazi occupation during the Second World War, mm-hmm. where you had everything from like the Millorg who did stuff like, you know, blow up battleships and stuff um, <laughs> to um, like just like mass civil disobedience. Like one of the greatest stories I think that came out of that was after the Nazis took over, they ordered that the education system be Nazified and brought in line with teaching Nazi party doctrine. So every teacher in Norway went on strike and the Nazis ended up having to rescind the policy because there was nobody to run the schools. (laughs) And, you know, it's true that there even now, just look at the Nazis. It's the Nazis, yeah. Even now, though, we're seeing this in our education system where they're wanting to teach things like prayer, which you know I have seen so many pagans out there that are like, "Oh, you want to bring prayer back to school? Great, that's great. Let's learn about Hecate. Let's learn about Kali. Let's learn about this. Let's learn." About... Bless you all for your chaos. I love it. It, it. it brings joy to my dark little heart. I love it. Uh, but, you know, seeing stuff like that, but we're also seeing teachers who are really good teachers who are having to leave the teaching industry because they just are so abused for things that they do outside in their private life. 
you know, like they might be LGBTQ, they might have a child that is LGBTQ and these things, and they're so harassed by the school system that now they're like, you know what, I'm not even going to have to do it anymore. I love teaching the kids. I love doing my job, but no, I'm done. And I think that we do need to see a lot more of this. And, you know, lots of people have called for general strikes and stuff like that. But I do think that once we start doing these things, uh, they're going to realize that all of the little worker bees that they want to do all the jobs so they can stay in power are not going to be doing the work anymore. So how are they going to keep the hive running? Exactly. Just food for thought, everybody. Just yeah. food for thought. Uh, all, all I'm going to say is, strikes to have a pretty good track record mm -hmm. of getting things done. Um, I, I don't think it, that it's a coincidence that Martin Luther King was shot while addressing a garbage workers strike of black workers who were trying to unionize, um, for example. Yeah. Or, you know, all of what happened in the thirties because of, you know, workers doing like sit down strikes or um, standing strikes or, you know, general strikes like San Francisco had a full-on general strike in 1934. Um, and things changed very quickly, including mm -hmm. like the Longshore Union came out of that as a recognized entity, you know. So, you know, these things work. They do work, you know, and it's just one of those things that we also we have to come together and we have to organize. That's the one thing that we're like, oh, yeah, this is a really great idea. I want to get involved. We need to help other people who are willing to organize these, help them find the resources, get involved. And that might be doing some Google searching, trying to figure out what's local in your area. There's tons of resources. I don't even know all the resources because I'm not somebody who can physically go out and strike myself. Um, being chronically ill, I can't do it. But I am somebody who likes to help raise the voice. That's one thing I can do. And I have lots of great knowledge for how to survive in a world where, you know, food shortages happen, like how to garden, all these things. I know how to do all that. I'm not somebody that can go stand out there and, you know, be on the front lines and I can't do that. But I do have other resources. If you were somebody that's like me, there are valuable skills in your repertoire that can help with these things. You just have to figure out what's useful. That's the only thing. Yeah. And that's also one thing that um we're doing through uh the site on black wings called the heathen cookbook which is trying to gather all this information and contacts and all this I'm, i'll show you the link real quick um and you know if you have information you want to submit or like say you have a great article about you know how to uh, like set up a window box a uh, garden or something like that like please send it in like we want stuff that we can put up on there because especially for our community, nothing can be more helpful than information. <laughs> I have way too much information that would probably overwhelm your book, just for the record, on that kind of <laughs> stuff. But it, it's my hyper focus. I love it. I love talking about it. It's actually where our program actually originated. A lot of people wanted to learn how to garden and they wanted to know how to kind of deal with inflation. That was where it started. And we literally started in June. It's gone completely off the rails, taken off in the best of ways. And we have done everything from self-defense training now to gardening, to homesteading, to animal husbandry, everything under the sun that you could possibly think of to figure out how to survive in a crazy world and how to do it legally where you live. So if you want the information, I am happy to share it, but I may overwhelm you because I have a lot. <laughs> Uh, th that's awesome that'd be great like it's like the more we can get this information out and share it like the better for everybody absolutely it's, yes like and you know if the only thing you know how to do that you think is different or interesting is you can darn socks well hey that means you know how to stitch and you know how to mm -hmm. do like other useful things related to that and that's important um I think that people really do a lot of times when you talk about trying to, you know, think about revolution and think about how to fix a society and how to come together as a community. I think we do think first and foremost front lines, like, you know, being out there in the streets. Yes, that is important. But there's a lot of things that have to happen behind the scenes that kind of get ignored when people talk about this. And that's things like cooking, gardening obviously stitching clothing, uh, you know, taking care of children, 
uh, and I'm not, we're not talking daycares, we're talking like literal villages. When we say it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to come together, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about building that. And it's so much more important than just kind of sitting back and saying, oh, I'm going to go fight out there in the streets and do the thing and protest and strike. And that's all great. If you, that's what you can do, please do it. But if you are somebody who can't and you're like, that's not me, or you're an introvert and you just don't want to be around people, but you want to go sit in a corner and knit some socks, please do. All is welcome. Just like Norse paganism, all is welcome. No matter what your skill is, it is welcome because not everybody can do it. Exactly. Like everybody is valuable. Everybody is worthy. Yes, everybody is worthy. And a lot of times right now, society is telling you that even if you can't go out and do these things or you can't go do this, um, you know, job or whatever, but you have this other skill that you're actually particularly good at, even if you are somebody that's like, I know the knowledge of this really well because I used to be able to do it, but I can't do it because of injury, illness or whatever, but you could teach somebody that's still also equally as valuable. Don't let society tell you that you are a broken individual because you no longer can do something. If you can explain it to somebody, I guarantee you are still valuable. Yeah. Uh, that's like one of the things that I think is also beautiful about heathen practice, particularly an inclusive practice, mm -hmm. is that, like, you know, it's the Havamal verse that everyone uh, always likes to quote in, like, Norse pagan circles of, Cattle die, kinsmen die, and so dies oneself. One thing I know never dies is the fame of the deeds of the dead. And there's something about that that says what matters is what it is you do. And mm -hmm. if you're looking at yourself in terms of what it is you do, then what matters is you and your circumstances and what you're facing and what you had to overcome in doing those things. Like no one else can say what it is that you do is worthy or unworthy just because it's not something that's, you know, glorious and going to be in the history books or something like that. If it was some overcoming like a particular challenge or a particular problem was a huge struggle for you, then that you did it is just as worthy as someone who gains like, you know, recognition and notoriety for being exceptionally gifted at a particular skill or something. Mm -hmm. um, like if we are our deeds, then those deeds depend on the circumstances that we're living in and who we are. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it, that's, there's so many different aspects of Norse paganism that you often will hear you'd be like, oh, I want to follow Odin and I want to go to Valhalla and I want to do this thing and I want to be the, you know, big bad shield warrior. Um, and I use shield warriors inclusive because male or female um, or non-binary, whichever you prefer. Um, it's one of those things that, again, you don't have to do all of the, I want to say outward facing version of Norse paganism, which is the rough and tumble Norse paganism that's depicted by the Vikings. And I think that there's still so much more that you can do that's part of hearth and home. Um, I one thing that really kind of comes to mind bringing it back to your book is you talk about the power of uh, Frigga and how she was supposed to be just this she's always represented as the deity of hearth and home but she's so much more than that and you know same with Freya Freya is often depicted as you know this beautiful goddess but she's also so much more and I think it's because we have tried again to put them in pretty little boxes that they don't always fit into and so it's one of those things that you don't have to fit in the pretty outward facing box you can do all of the stuff because you're so much more than that and so are the gods and you did describe that all beautifully in the book again this is going to be the the one moment where i tell everybody go buy ryan's book because i promise you it has everything you want to know about norse paganism and more go buy it it's so good <laughs> It's on Audible, it's on Amazon, it's on everywhere. Please go buy a copy. It's so good. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we are just about out of time. The one thing I always leave open at the end of every conversation that we have, uh, which this conversation has been so amazing and so impactful and so beautiful, 
is do you have any upcoming works or projects or things besides the cookbook that we're talking about, which uh, if it's cool with you, I'd be happy to link that in the show description. Um, if not, that's totally okay. It might be available oh, go later. For it. Okay. But go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and promote all of your works, all your stuff, everything that you're doing. Promote it out, please. Okay. Um, so the uh I blah, 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 sorry. Um, so I've got a few projects that I've got going on. Um I post up like uh blog entries. I'm kind of at two a month, hoping to go for more at the site on blackwings.com. Uh, I have a podcast of Wayward Wanderer, which you can find on iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all the other cool places where podcasts live. Um, and I have an upcoming book that's going to be coming out in, uh, it's slated for some point next summer, um, called Spinning Weird, which for anyone Ooh. who's read the uh, Way of Fire and Ice is going to be the book about basically chapter two, but a lot more length about like the like talking more about weird and animism and talking about the nine worlds and all this sort of like, you know, the the framework of this whole like world and the way that pe the, you know, what we sorry, in the way that that works in practice. Um, and it also gets into like some cool stuff like Nordic necromancy and more um, on sitting out um, and other stuff from Save. So um, th there's going to be some good stuff in that. And for anyone who is free on the weekend of uh, August uh, 5th through the 8th, which I know is coming up pretty quick, uh, Between the Veils is hosting their first conference in San Jose, California, and it's a like general pagan conference, um, actively inclusive and uh, promoting all the good stuff in terms of values and practices. And uh, I will, along with other people, will be hosting a fire and ice suite there and also will be giving a couple of workshops. So, you know, if you can make it out, come on by and say hi. Um, and... I also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash wayward wanderer. Um, and five a month gets everything. So awesome. yeah, that's basically all my shameless plugs, I think. Um, <laughs> shameless uh, plugs are also... always welcome. We always promote everybody as we as often as we can because everybody needs love these days. Yeah. Like we all gotta help each other out. Absolutely. And, and also if you're looking for any kind of uh related community uh fire and ice has a facebook group and a discord server um oh sweet which i can link the disc the current discord server link now because okay. you know discord says these are only good for a week um <laughs> that's completely fair um it, at any time i'm sure if people wanted to get involved with that discord they could probably contact you on twitter i'm presuming uh yep okay cool and yeah y'all can always find me on twitter um sometimes i post about uh norse pagan stuff sometimes it's about the whole mess of rising fascism <laughs> sometimes it's about cool alternative stuff like degrowth and people doing neat stuff with renewable energy um that you know. It's all good and, stuff. I promise. I follow him on Twitter. He's a fantastic person to follow, uh, which is really funny because I didn't realize it was you for till like probably three or four months ago. Then I was like, wait a minute, Ryan Smith, why does that name sound so familiar? And then I looked at it and I was like, oh, that's why he's the author of that book. OK, <laughs> I do that a lot with a lot of pagan authors, unfortunately. I'm like, oh, you're a really fun human. I'm going to follow you on the, you know, social media. And then it's like, oh, you're also a slightly famous human. That's why I know you. <laughs> 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 which is all great these are all the great incredible things uh your conference that you just talked about i'm presuming that's in person and there's no digital options uh yes okay. unfortunately um uh, i don't think the conference organize like that that's a hard problem that a lot of conferences have been trying to figure out how to do is do both in person and online um yeah because you know it does make things more accessible mm -hmm. and you know COVID is still 
a thing. Um, yes, COVID is still very much a thing, everybody. Wear your masks, take care of yourselves. Uh, and it, 95s are awesome. Um, yeah, and 95s are awesome. If you, you need some good links, I can link you something because I, I have some good in 95s that I get and keep stocked because, again, chronically ill. Uh, but yes, you know, take care of yourselves out there, especially because COVID is getting more dangerous and more scary again. Uh, not that it hasn't always been that way but you know it's getting worse so take care of yourselves everybody i will say the one thing that i have noticed with a lot of pagan conferences is a lot of times they will do a full outdoor you know big space conference that people can go to in person and then do a smaller uh one a couple of months later online for people mm -hmm. who couldn't be there uh in person so that might be an option that those folks could do as well so yeah, I know they did one previously in February because they had to reschedule to Omicron. Um, mm -hmm. So good times. Good times yeah. indeed. Well, yeah. all of that sounds so good. I'm so looking forward to your next book. I cannot wait for that. That's going to be awesome. And this has been just awesome having you here. You are welcome to come back by the show anytime you'd like to promote anything that you're doing. Uh, it's just been a joy to have you and you're welcome anytime. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great uh, being on with you, Pagan. Mm. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, you guys know what to do. Take care of yourselves. Be good to each other. Uh, organize. Be good. All that good stuff. And promote a little safe chaos. I'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody.